We'd like to, to, to dedicate this town hall to our comrade Frank Stearns, who lost his life this past Friday from the complications of the COVID-19 virus. Frank was a volunteer at the New York office and a veteran of the, of the Vietnam War, member of Vets for Peace. Uh, he, was a, he was always a cheerful man, making everyone feel welcome. Uh, to uh, anyone that joined, that came or joined or he met, um, he had great stories. He was just a, a loving and beautiful spirit that he had. And so we wanna let him know that his loving spirit will never be forgotten and that we dedicate this town hall to him. <clears throat> now we'd like to, uh, there's Frank. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Joe Sims, who's a national co-chair of the Communist Party. Joe. Thank you very much, Rosanna. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, for that wonderful tribute. Uh, uh, Audrey, uh, Frank was a real hero to all of us. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, comrades, Good evening, we're so happy to see all of you here. Uh, we're hoping you're keeping healthy, uh, physically distant, but communally and socially close. It is so important, we need all of us. We know that we're going through some uh, difficult times, that's why we're here, but we also know that we're gonna get through it. You know, I just look at the example uh, set by the frontline workers and, and it, gives me, it gives me so, so much hope. But I gotta say that the thing that keeps me up at night is the thought that this didn't have to happen, you know? It didn't have to be this way if, if only they had listened. Look at the example uh, set by China. Okay, they made some mistakes at first, but they corrected them, and now they're able to help other countries. By the way, I read this morning uh, that China is gifting New York with 1,000 respirators. I'm in New York, by the way. Thank you, China. That's what I call solidarity. And speaking of solidarity, Look at the example set by Socialist Cuba, a small island in the Caribbean under embargo by this country. But on this issue, they are punching like heavyweights, sending doctors to Brazil, to Italy, to Spain, to other countries. Of course, you got to say you don't have to be a socialist or a communist to see the dangers posed by this virus. You do, however, have to be sane. Look at South Korea. I don't get it. If, if Trump had, had only listened to the scientists, 
but no. He had to go and call it a hoax. He had to go and call it a scam. He had to go and call it the China virus. And there he is standing in the White House, lying, sending mixed signals. One day, wear a scarf. Next day, don't wear a scarf. Third day, he says, I ain't wearing no scarf. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Go to work, don't go to work. It's a mass of confusion. Can you imagine? They wanted to send us back to work on Easter. Easter, at the height of the crisis, hundreds of thousands, maybe more, would have gotten sick and died. They just didn't care. And you know who was going to be affected the most. You know what we say, when the world catches cold, people of color catch pneumonia. And for what? So that they can maintain the corporate bottom line? By the way, we scored a big victory last Sunday when Trump was compelled to stay at, to extend the stay at home policy until April. It was a big victory and don't let nobody tell you nothing different. It just goes to show you that the march and slogan that we use that a people united can't be defeated is true. And the people were united on this issue. But we can't get too excited because they're using the excuse of the crisis to implement their agenda anyway. Corporations can now pollute as much as they want. They are turning asylum seekers back at the border. State governors are denying abortions. They're getting rid of paid sick leave. Yeah, the paid sick leave that Congress just passed, now they're gutting it. They're making it harder for public workers to organize. And organize we must. You know that the unemployment rate could go as high as 30%. That's higher than during the depression. And during the depression, the only way to address the crisis was for the government to provide public works jobs, government jobs. Today, in this situation, that means the Green New Deal plus more. We've got to rebuild the roads, we've got to rebuild the trains, we've got to rebuild the water plants, the electrical grid, the internet, bring it to the country, the bridges, you name it, on a whole new sustainable basis. Will it be enough? I don't know. But if not, then it's got to be whatever it takes to do it. That's what Bernie said in a town hall last week, and I agree with him. Whatever it takes to solve the crisis, we have to fight to make that so. And in the first place, that means addressing the crisis in the hospitals. They're overrun. Can the problem be solved as they are presently constituted in this private system? I don't know. Spain faced the same problem. They had to socialize their hospitals. Do we need to do that here? Well, whatever it takes. That includes, uh, brothers and sisters, the crisis at the border and the thousands held in overcrowded detention. The Congressional Hispanic Caucus says release them. We agree. And while we're releasing people, let's take a look at those who are incarcerated for nonviolent drug offenses. And how about, how about an amnesty for the elderly for whom this virus will be a death sentence? Comrades, if there's one thing to me that's clear, it is that this administration has to be defeated in November, whatever it takes. And we believe in the Communist Party that it's gonna take a movement and a platform that such a movement can unite around. In this socialist moment, we welcome Bernie's campaign. It had a movement behind it and so it appeared did Elizabeth Warren's. So tonight, uh, comrades, we say to all of you, 
Let us unite and defeat the right. Our ability to uh, help the people most affected by this crisis depends on it. Our ability to defend democracy as limited as it is in this crisis depends on it. And make no mistake, those are the stakes. You know, we have no illusions about the forces involved. We know that our ability to organize on the ground will determine what will happen in a new administration. But the crisis we are faced with is ongoing. Capitalism is failing and people are beginning to see that. And it is precisely when capitalism fails that people begin to see the need for socialist solutions. So let us uh, uh, gather together our forces. Let us uh, organize our work. Let us uh, prepare for the big battles ahead and let us uh, take care of each other as we do so. Lend a hand, uh, make a phone call, cook a meal, go to the drugstore, the doctor, wash some clothes, whatever people need. You know, our working class is ready to fight and we believe we can win. We saw that when the teachers struck, we saw it when the auto workers went out and we're seeing it as this crisis unfolds. And that gives us great confidence that we're gonna come through this and we're gonna come through it more united better organized and more able to put our class and people on a better footing. And by the way, before I end, let me say, we've got to stop Trump from invading Venezuela, you know, because once that kind of thing happens, Lord knows what's going to happen next. So stay healthy, please stay strong, stay physically distant for now. Uh, stay, let's say, socialistically close. Um, and let's stay in the fight. Thank you very much. Rosanna, who's coming next? Thank you, Joe. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Barbara Vereen from Unite Here, Local 35, New Haven. Barbara? Hi, um, my name is Barbara Vereen uh, with Unite Here, Local 34 in New Haven. Our union represent, um, our international union represent hotel, hosp uh, hospitality, airline catering, and casino workers. Um, Local 34 New Haven represent workers at Yale. Um, I wanna talk in two parts. The first part is about our international union, which our industry was hit uh, really bad. About 75% of our membership have been laid off or have lost their jobs and in the process losing their health care. Um, what we have been doing with, um, with our, our international union as we set up a fund to, to, um, to, help, for, uh, to help our workers out, um, you'll see uh, we have a donation page. You'll see that um, come up later. But also we have been petitioning um, the, late, the state and federal legislators around a bill that asks them to um, not cut off people's utilities because um, some of our workers are in some of the lower wage jobs, um, not to cut off their utilities um, and, um, and to um, continue their health care and extend unemployment. And so as you see, some of those bills have passed. Um, the other thing um, that we're doing um, for, um, for the workers at Yale, we have about 3,700 members in our bargaining unit. Um, of those 3,700, 700 of those people are critical workers, which means they come to work every single day during this epidemic. They work in, they work in the clinics, they take care of the patients, they work in animal resources. And what we've been doing is we've been um, pushing Yell, pushing Yell to do the right thing by the employer, by their employees. Um, we've been fighting for safety equipment, um, for PPE, you know, there's a big shortage around 
um, the N95 masks and the surgical masks. We've been pressing them that our workers are on the front line and they, they're faced with this every day. People coming in and they're not having the proper equipment to do their job or to make sure that they're safe um, when, uh, when they come to work. Um, we have been fighting for working conditions to have alternate schedule to create social distancing for our members so that people are not working on top of one another, but also having an alternate staff just in case some of a group of one group gets sick that there's that is not infecting everyone, but that there's they're alternating the staff. Um, we also have been fighting um, for um, creating giving them critical pay in this moment where people are putting their lives on the line um, instead and giving them an incentive or also like holding managers accountable for reducing the amount of staff that's actually needed um, during this time. And so I'm just trying to make sure I hit on all the points that I wrote down. And so in this moment where um, when we actually yell to lead in this moment, right? Because they can lead other employers in this region around making sure that people are safe. Um, we have had um, five of our members tested positive and we have had one member pass away um, last night because of the COVID-19. This is a serious matter. We take it serious um, and each and every one of us is gonna to be touched by this. And we just gotta to stick together and hold the president accountable, hold the governors accountable, make sure that we get the safety equipment to people who, who are on the front line, putting their lives on the line to make sure other people are safe. Um, and, and, our, and so we have a donation page, right? We have in New Haven, we have 217. I don't know if I got kicked out. Uh, we have local 217 is our hospitality workers in New Haven and um, 70, 85% of their members have lost their jobs. And so if people can donate, uh, it helps us keep uh, while we're fighting to keep people's insurance going. Um, this can help and go a long way. And our people, and you could donate in a place that's um, in a region that's close to you um, because we have... Um, unions all over the country. Great. That's all Thank I have to say. Thank I don't you. know if there's questions. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Barbara. Uh, we will have questions. I'm sorry, I meant to say this before. We will have a, a question and answer period after all of the presenters, uh, and you'll be able to do that via uh, chat room. Uh, right now, uh, we do have a comrade and a reporter from the People's World who is uh, stationed in China uh, living in Beijing, uh, he does have to go to work. So I'm gonna ask him to uh, give us a little presentation uh, before he has to sign off. So Ian Goodman, Goodman, Goodrum, sorry. Goodrum, yeah, no worries. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, just a few things to, to cover some ground um, because there's been a, there's been an out and out informational warfare campaign going on to kind of discredit the Chinese experience and China's response to the virus, which has been, um, in my opinion, in the opinion of many others, exemplary. Uh, public health experts are in agreement on this. The only people that are really uh, coming out against it are, are politicians and journalists who have an ax to grind. Um, the thing that, that strikes me the most right now is I see pictures from the US of the, the so-called PPE um, which we've heard a lot about personal protective equipment. It's, it's meant to, it's not just anything that provides a barrier um, against the virus. It's a very specific set of, of clothing. It's a very specific uh, process by which you put it on and take it off. There's, there's testing you have to do. It's very rigorous. And the PPE that, you know, I, PPE I use very uh, loosely because of a lack of supply is, you know, in some places you're seeing garbage bags, in some places you're seeing bed sheets. Um, the thing that, that, that hits me a lot is one of the things that happened in terms of China's response is they moved uh, healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses um, from all over the country moved into Hubei province and Wuhan, the capital, which were the hardest hit areas of the country. 
and for about 42,000 of them went in and most of them have um, since come out. The thing that, that, that hits me a lot is getting a little bit of an echo. Um, and, and of those 42,000 people, there wasn't a single infection. Um, and you, you hear stories right now from healthcare workers in the US saying they're scared, saying that they know people that are being infected, they know people that have died. Um, and as Joe said, you know, there's a better way, right? There, there's, there's a right way and a wrong way to do this. And it, it just, it absolutely kills me that the right way is now being politicized and turned into a cudgel in an information war, uh, warfare campaign. So the basics as far as, as, far as what we need to, to think about. Um, and I mean, the thing is, you can talk about China's response, but the reason why it happened and the reason why it was successful was because they had they had a a state apparatus an economic apparatus that could redirect production toward necessary items ppe masks ventilators um the the redirection of state industries that you can't i mean you can't do here because there's very few if any industries uh large industries that are state owned or operated um there's there's been an attempt to kind of attempt to do something like this with the Defense Production Act, but it's been slow. And there's a, there's a reliance on private capital that as we're seeing is, is very, very inadequate. Um, so for me, it, it shows you the difference in one system versus another. You know, this is not about point scoring. It's not about, um, it's not about creating clout for the system. I mean, the results speak for themselves, but we wanna save lives. We wanna help people. We wanna make sure people are getting the care they need. And through redirection of production, through a widespread testing regime, through the creation of new facilities for hospitalizations, through the, re the appropriation of large, uh, large spaces for centralized quarantine, movement tracking, all these things that other countries are now doing, but piecemeal. Uh, Italy has started to do some of this, Spain has done some of this, but they did it very late. There was a, there was a, a delay in uh, implementing these measures. Uh, because there was a fear of the economy suffering for it. Well, uh, China understood that uh, there would be economic consequences, but it was it was worth taking the hit in order to save lives. And so they have the kinds of measures that can keep the economy stable and and the kind of economy that doesn't rely on explosive growth to stay solvent. Um, so we're seeing the same things in Italy and Spain repeat themselves: a delay. Uh, an unwillingness to do what's necessary. And um, in, in places like the ROK, I mean, they're using, they're using some of China's methods, some of which were also used during the SARS outbreak. The building of temporary hospitals was also something that happened back then. Um, so there's a, there's a desire to kind of paint this narrative of China uh, obfuscating and lying, which is not, has no evidence whatsoever. There's, uh, there's an attempt to say that the, the numbers are wrong, that there's more deaths and more infections that have been reported. Certainly there is some underreporting going on just because, not, not through deliberate action, but because you can't test absolutely everybody. You, know, you, can't, you can't say this number represents every single person who's been infected, but you can say this is a good approximation. Um, but there's been an attempt to say that this is a deliberate undercounting, which is not backed up by the facts. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, for me, seeing China helping other places, no matter whether they're socialist or capitalist or, or what have you, um, I mean, that shows, again, as Joe said, an example of solidarity, right? China understands that the people of the United States aren't responsible for this informational warfare campaign. They know that it's the government and they still want to help because they know that the, the regular people are not responsible for this. Um, so for me, I, I see what's going on and I see the kind of lies that are being spread um and i hope we can do our best to fight that and we can learn from our from our comrades uh here in china okay. that's all i had I, I unfortunately won't be able to stay for questions sorry about that okay thank you thank you uh ian and uh you can read some of ian's articles in the people's world so uh thank you very much for taking that time and now i would like to hear from ava frank Fracas from the metropolitan housing she'll talk to us about the rent strike actions Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Hi, good evening. I'm Ava Farkas. I'm the director of the Met Council on Housing. We're one of the oldest uh, community tenant organizing grassroots organizations in New York City. We've been around for 60 years. And, um, you know, the crisis for renters in New York City and in many cities around the country um, is really acute right now. Um, we know that um, in New York City, rents are so high that already a majority of renters are spending, before this crisis, we're spending 30% of their income on rent. Um, and in a survey that a, a real estate uh, website did, 40% uh, of renters reported that if they lose income or hours due to this crisis, they're not gonna be able to afford next month's rent. Um, we, we also run a hotline, so we're talking to renters uh, every day about uh, their inability to pay. Um, and so I wanted to talk today about some of the solutions um, that we're proposing, uh, not just as an organization, but across the tenant movement in New York City. So one action that we took early on was to petition Governor Cuomo to issue an eviction moratorium. Um, which we did win. We won that in a couple of days, uh, which was really remarkable. Um, and so this eviction moratorium means that for the time being, housing court is closed across the state and no evictions that either were pending or were even in motion can be carried out anymore by marshals. So for the time being, tenants are safe from being brought to housing court for a non-payment of rent. Um, the problem is that once this eviction moratorium is lifted and it will eventually end and housing court reopens, there could be hundreds of thousands of renters that are facing immediate eviction. Um, so we don't think that that's the, uh, you know, that that's the solution to this crisis. We're, we're seeing now how important housing is as a form of health care for all of us right now. Um, our homes are keeping us safe and nobody should be, um, nobody's home and safety and, and sanctuary should be um, a question or under threat at this time. So um, what we're calling for now is we're calling on Cuomo to cancel the rent, suspend the rent, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, we're collecting signatures on a petition statewide. We have almost 90,000 signatures on that petition now. Um, we know reporters are starting to ask him about this in the daily press briefings. Um, and uh, one action that tenants now are taking, and this is really you know, an action of necessity, um, is people are starting April 1st, which was last, which was last week, um, many, many renters are not able to afford this rent, uh, this month's rent, and many will not be able to afford to pay rent on May 1st. Um, so we are um, helping tenants who cannot pay the rent right now join together under a collective, um, a collective rent strike action. Um, and, you know, this is a somewhat different from a typical rent strike, which is generally organized by a building of tenants together. And it's generally a uh, action to leverage changes, you know, conditions changes in your building. Um, usually people are choosing to withhold their rent. They can afford the rent, but they're choosing to withhold it. This is somewhat different in nature. People cannot pay the rent because people cannot work. And, um, but we wanna turn around what can be sort of an isolating and, um, shameful experience for people um, into something that um, is a collective action in nature and, and lets people know that they're not alone in this, that there are hundreds of thousands of renters out there that are gonna be in the same boat. And our demand through this collective action is that- and, um, uh, but We wanna turn around what can be sort of an isolating um, and- um, uh, Joe, I, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, so, sorry. Um, so, um, so our demand, our collective demand of this action is that Cuomo find a collective solution to this problem. Um, uh, and so uh, some of the tools we have for people are 
Uh, we have a rent strike toolkit, which has a lot of guidelines about how to go on to rent strike, how to talk to your neighbors, how to create a mutual aid network in your building, a poster you can put in your window. Um, and we also want to be in touch with everyone who's going on rent strike or thinking of going on rent strike out of necessity because we want to make sure that if we don't win our demands now that we're able to fight when the courts reopen and fight to stop all of these evictions that could potentially happen. So if you'd like to receive that kit, you can text rent strike to 646-542-1920. I'll put that also in the chat. I don't know if the audience can see the chat. Um, and then if you are a renter in New York City and you'd like to call our organization and talk through you know, what you can do in your situation, we have a hotline Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays uh, in the afternoons and evenings. And that number is 212-979-0611. I'll also put in the chat the links to um, sign the petition to Governor Cuomo and um, a flyer you can put up in your building. And I know there's people on the call from lots of different places um, around the country, but um, I know things like this, efforts like this are happening in other cities around the country. Uh, renters everywhere are, are really facing this stress right now. Um, so whatever, you know, whatever help we can be to uh, where you are in the country, please uh, reach out, let us know. Great. Thank you, Eva. Uh, now we'll hear from uh, Sean, who is a member of the uh, Southern California uh, Orange County Club of the Communist Party. Uh, he'll speak to us about some mutual aid actions taking place there. Sean? Well, hello, friends. My name is Sean, and I'm extremely happy to be talking about this subject because the importance of mutual aid in light of our current crisis really can't be overstated. All across the nation, we're seeing our most vulnerable communities completely abandoned. And for large parts of our population, what little stability they were able to find has been thrown into complete chaos because of this outbreak and the utter inadequate response. Mutual aid is gonna be one of the most worthwhile projects we can undertake going forward. With literally millions of workers out of a job, many other groups will find themselves in the same place as our club here in Orange County, where for the foreseeable future, when it comes to mutual aid and community support, either the Communist Party steps up or nobody does. And this very grim and very real dynamic has led our group to drastically ramp up our outreach projects and try to push as many supplies to our homeless family as we can while there's still time as safely as possible. And now I've only got three minutes, so I can't quite go into the detail I like, but I want to give everyone some action points from the lessons that we've learned along the way that hopefully you will find helpful. So first and foremost, one of the best things your group can do during this time, if you seriously plan to do mutual aid, is to start collecting donations. Canned food, box goods, bottled water, basic medical supplies, if you can find them, clothes, hygiene products, literally anything people are willing to give you. A lot of the public are looking to help out in this time, so you might be surprised with what you can get your hands on just through canvassing your contacts. And if there's a group in your area that's currently doing some outreach or some sort of mutual aid, you can take some of the donations that you've received and pass on some goods to them. And by doing so, you're building those relationships and expanding your network through that exchange. Uh, if you're collecting donations and you don't have anyone to donate to, then my advice would be to just sit on your donation pile and prepare to hit the ground running with hot meals and ready supplies for our communities when we can safely go back outside because there's going to be a lot of folks in need. Uh, a really important pillar of mutual aid is a concept that I'm sure a lot of folks here have heard before, and that is the idea of solidarity, not charity. And this concept has a very real material difference in how and why you go about serving the people. Because as revolutionary organizations, we are not undertaking this simply to have a, a warm, fuzzy feeling in our hearts as we drive home. We are doing this to empower and prepare the working class for the eventual overthrow of our criminally inhumane system. So some examples of that would be to have at least some literature that you can take with you on outreach that's geared towards the communities you're trying to serve and be prepared to explain who you are and why you are doing this. 
because uh, when talking with other groups about mutual aid in our area, the conversation usually comes up at some point. Do we want to be revolutionaries about this or are we trying to help and provide support? And the answer clearly is to be a revolutionary. And the last topic would be social media. If you can get into the habit of documenting and posting everything you do related to mutual aid, any activities for all that at all for that matter. And you're doing this not simply for the street cred or an ego boost, but because the people need to know that you are active, that your group is actually doing things and is a real option to give support and receive donations. So uh, that's all the time I have for. I hope that some of these ideals were, ideas were at least a little helpful for your groups going forward. And I would love to answer any questions anybody has. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Uh, that's really uh, very helpful. Uh, we'd like to list a few resources right now uh, as uh, while Cameron gets ready to give us a, a little bit of music. Um, Laura, can you post those resources up for us? Also, in the meantime, as we're waiting, Carmez, if you want to send us any if you have any questions or send us any other things, uh, please feel free to, you can email us uh, after the show or at uh, cpusa at cpusa.org. So here's some of the uh, resources, grant space uh, resources for individuals and nonprofits, small businesses, National Alliance for Mental, Mental Illness resources uh, organize uh, around questions of, regarding the uh, COVID questions people have regarding the virus, the Center for Disease Control information uh, about all aspects, one fair wage resources amid and at restaurants, aimed at restaurants and other type of uh, tip workers who have lost income, the AFL-CIO resources for all workers, especially those Organize an AFL-CIO and unions. Uh, union Plus offers financial, homeowner, and healthcare assistance for union members and families. A national uh, resource, a National Restaurant Association, industry relief fund uh, for workers, and the uh, state of California information about benefits and on the virus. Uh, so now we'll hear a little bit of from uh, Cameron. Cameron, go ahead. We don't hear you, Cameron. Okay, now we do. After Cameron, we will uh, hear regarding the uh, CARES Act, which is the uh, other, sometimes known as the stimulus bill. Go ahead, Cameron. We don't hear anything, Cameron. Okay, now we do.
Thank you, Cameron. That was really nice. Now we'll hear from uh, Roberta Wood. Uh, she'll be uh, giving us a, laying out the what is what is the CARES Act and how is it beneficial for workers. Go ahead, Roberta. And speaking for the Communist Party's Labor Commission, we've got to fight for workers who've lost their jobs, and we've got to fight for those who are still in the workplace. We're all terrified. You know, the Republicans original big business proposal spent hundreds of billions of dollars on uh, bailouts for big business and it only appropriated a token one time payment to workers. Their proposal was like 2008 on steroids. But the difference this year was a House of Representatives that had been elected by a labor movement that was mobilized and, and that that House of Representatives was answerable to that labor movement. And the AFL-CIO also had a lot of influence. That Congress, with Nancy Pelosi in the lead, forced a package that provides income replacement for tens of millions of workers who have lost their jobs. This is income not to stimulate the economy. It's not a stimulus bill to get people back on the job, but income to stay home and get off the job and stop the spread of the pandemic. Um, AFSCME offers a good um, summary of this bill, and uh, we're going to give you that uh, link to that. But meanwhile, let me just mention a couple of the pr provisions that relate to income for replacement. The CARES Act, which stands for Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, provides extended unemployment compensation. It eliminates the waiting week. And you know, state benefits are usually about a third or half of a worker's check. The CARES Act adds an additional $600 a week, making up the difference for most low and middle income workers. And uh, for the first time, unlike state unemployment comp, it covers gig workers, contract, uh, what so-called contractors and self-employed workers. Um, the CARES Act also provides subsidies for businesses to keep workers on their payrolls and to continue their health care. Uh, and additionally, these businesses are required to be neutral in union drives. The biggest weakness, and it's a huge one, is that no one without a social security number can access these benefits. Undocumented workers are denied the right to have social security numbers. This is cruel and shameful, and it has to be a priority for all of us to correct. We can't abandon millions of working class families to starve in this pandemic. No legislation has addressed the plight of millions of Americans who are still on the job. And I have to ask how many thousands, thousands of us will die because the workplace health and safety requirements don't exist and there's no enforcement. Uh, you can see this little fact I, we put up here. The U.S. spends 12 times as much for ICE enforcement as it does for workplace safety inspectors. We've seen waves of rank and file workers, both those who have access to union representation and those who don't, courageously walk off the job at Amazon warehouses in New York, at healthcare facilities in California, at transit barns in Chicago, at grocery stores and construction sites in Texas, demanding the PPE, demanding basic sanitation and demanding an end to non-essential work. This pandemic explodes some myths that capitalist captains of industry preach. No, this country is not broke. The resources are there to take care of the people. A for-profit healthcare system does not work for the American people. Uber drivers and other gig workers are not contractors. They are workers. And most of all, the myth of the CEO and hedge fund manager as the driving force in this economy is bullshit. It doesn't make a damn bit of difference if the Walton family, Jeff Bezos, or Oracle's Larry Craig, they're all sheltering at home. Nobody can, it makes us no difference, but it's the person picking the lettuce packing the chicken, sanitizing the hotel rooms, stocking the shelves at Trader's Joe's who are essential to our economy. They're the ones, we're the ones who should own it and run it. So we have to move forward to transform the wave of rank and file struggles 
into a tsunami of working class political power, of union power. We need to extend the income replacement, fight for safety on the job, protect our undocumented siblings. When, when the epidemic subsides, a stimulus bill to get people back to work must be based on the Green New Deal, union rights, building infrastructure. The Labor Commission of the Communist Party invites all workers to join us in our monthly discussion on these issues. You can write us at laborcommission at cpusa.org to be invited to these meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Um, as you know, we have many demands and you can see some of them right here on, our, on the screen. Um, definitely a moratorium on rent, mortgage, uh, and other loan payments and cancellations of all student debt, the moratorium on evictions and repossession, open up bank, vacant public buildings uh, for public housing and facilities to house the homeless. Uh, I'm gonna call on Michael who, who is going to uh, take us through a, a, an action that we can take right away to uh, begin to work on this. Go ahead, Michael. Well, I just wanted to say that it's been great seeing everyone this evening and this town hall, you know, just shows how productive we can be in getting a picture of the scope of organizing taking place for the country and the world to hear. Um, so thank you to all the comrades who are tuning in and to all of our friends and supporters viewing as well. The people's movement is making demands and we would like to propose collective action with respect to one of them. A good place to go to check out this coalition in particular is the people's bailout Dot org. That's the people's bailout dot org. Hold Are on you done? Second. What happened? Okay. Um, that's the people's bailout dot org. And so what it is, it's a very large coalition formed by over 500 organizations, which have signed on so far. And it was actually initiated uh, by the Center for Popular Democracy, Climate Justice Alliance, uh, Greenpeace, Indigenous Environmental Network, Indivisible, Move On, People's Action, Sierra Club, the Sunrise Movement, US Climate Action Network, and so on. And so what they are basically doing is they're organizing around five principles. And those are number one, um, hold on one second. Number one, health is a top priority for all people with no exceptions. Number two, economic relief must be provided directly to the people. Uh, number three, rescue workers in communities and not corporate executives. Make a down payment, which is number four, on a regenerative economy while preventing future crises. And number five, protect our democratic process while protecting each other. These principles were actually initially introduced in a letter by representatives Dingle, Ocasio-Cortez, Jaya Paul, Pocan, and Lee in the House of Representatives, as well as by Senators Markey and Duckworth in the Senate. So these are the demands that are before Congress at the moment, and we are encouraged by our allies in the wider movement for democracy to write letters to our congresspersons or even directly tweet them online using the hashtag People's Bailout. So while we without a doubt understand that COVID-19 is the virus and that capitalism is indeed the crisis, um, these demands reflect a very realistic and pro-people reform which can be made in the short term. So thank you all for your time and I thank you all again for tuning in and expressing solidarity with the working class which will survive this crisis and will come out of it fighting like hell. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I think it's really important to, to take action and be active uh, especially during these times, it's better, it's even for our mental health is to be active in some form. Uh, it helps us to feel uh, that, that part, that's ne the necessary part for our mental health, especially when we're, we're indoors and all of that. At this time, we'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, we will not be taking questions by a raised hand. We will be taking questions via chat or the question answer. I'm sorry, the the Q and A feature on your um, uh, on the on this Zoom chat. Um, so I'd like to call on uh, Scott, who will monitor, who will present the questions. Go ahead, Scott. 
All right, uh, thank you, Rosanna, and thank you to all of our present presenters. Uh, we've already got a number of questions that have come in, um, and I thought I'd uh, start off with a, a really uh, concrete question. Um, uh, someone wrote in, I work at Michael's Craft Store. They put out an announcement that we should not talk to the media, but redirect them to Michael's media firm. We have run out of gloves and we aren't provided with masks. They have curbside pickup, but people are still coming in our store in masks because they are bored. I'm wondering if anyone has any advice on how to demand that our company takes care of its workers. Um, uh, so do you want questions one at a time or, or should? Uh, yeah, should one, yeah. Go ahead, can you? Okay, Bobby, can you? Um, no. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah. Yeah, Bobby, can you answer that please? Bobby? Roberta. Okay, I think that's a really um, important question. And I heard it from workers in other industries too. I heard it from workers in the construction industry who are working on condominium luxury condos and like, why in the hell are we on this job? We should, why are we risking our life? And I know people are bored, but I don't know why Michael's crafts is an essential industry. And I don't know why workers should be asked to risk their lives and their families um, to, to keep that business going. So I think that um, depending on the rules in the state that you're in, that there should be some lobbying and you should approach, um, you know, demand your, from your city council or, or whatever to uh, see that those businesses are closed. And also to, that Michael has the ability now, they can keep you on the payroll uh, they can uh, keep people, I don't know if they pay health care, but they, they have the ability to do that. So I would suggest get a group of workers together or one or two, whatever, talk to your management and uh, go right on up the chain. Uh, and also, even more important, notify local media about it. Uh, there's no reason for people to be putting their life at risk uh, in order to keep some businesses profits coming in. Thank you, Bobby. Next question, Scott. Uh, all right, um, so some of these questions uh, I'm going to um, kind of, if we get questions that are all around a similar theme or going in a similar direction, I'll sort of group them together. Yeah. Um, we've gotten a number of questions about uh, sort of the, the relation of our party to the, to the Democratic Party and to the, um, uh, to the plans being put forward or the, the programs being put forward by the Democratic Party. Uh, one, um, one, if there's one, um, sorry, I'm trying to find a, a particular uh, question that had some good wording. Um, uh, well, anyway, yes, so, um, Right. Uh, uh, when, uh, so one, one person asked, when are we going to lead the movement rather than joining all the others? Um, we'll never get bigger and stronger by joining and blending in with the Democrats. Um, uh, another person asked, you mentioned that you support statements by Sanders in the Hispanic caucus. How does CPUSA view the Democratic Party and its relationship to it? Uh, someone else asked uh, our position on the, the Biden campaign. Uh, in the context of the uh, of the COVID crisis. Thank you. Joe? Joe? Thank you. Well, those are tough questions. <laughs> Let me first say that, you know, our concept of leadership is one uh, which uh, uh, we argue that we don't declare ourselves anything, that you have to, you have to prove your mettle in the struggle uh, by taking initiative, by doing things, by uh, uh, fighting it out on the issues, as Sean and uh, other comrades have uh, said. You got to do it in the trade unions, you got to do it in the streets, you got to do it on the uh, uh, campuses. Um, and I think that, uh, that in this crisis, um, you know, we want to uh, work with everybody uh, who agrees with us on the issues to make that happen. That's the first thing, you know? 
uh, you know, the, the issue of uh, vanguard or, or leadership, uh, we don't have a narrow concept. We think that the class must lead and we wanna work uh, with others in the class to make that happen. Because if we're gonna have a socialist society in this country, we think it's gonna have to be a coalition. Now, on the issue of, uh, uh, of our relationship to the Democratic Party, well, we have no official relationship with the Democratic Party. You know, we uh, work uh, in coalition with Democrats and Christians and Muslims and socialists and people who are unaffiliated uh, to make sure uh, where we can uh, that uh, working class and uh, interests are met. You know, if the issue is police violence, you know, we work in a coalition on that. Uh, if it's immigration reform, we work in coalition. Uh, uh, conceptually, conceptually, we have a, a concept uh, that, that we call an inside outside strategy so that we will uh, work on uh, where we can on the campaigns of those democratic candidates who uh, take good, good positions on the one hand, but on the other hand, we work outside, you know, to bring pressure to bear on all of the political uh, parties. We are in a, a coalition uh, with a number of different left groups, you know, from uh, there, there's some from left roots, there's some from DSA, there's from, some from uh, COC, there's some from uh, Liberation uh, Road to develop uh, a, a left electoral strategy that will work for uh, uh, working class independence, you know, because the class as a whole you know, has to fight for its independence. Now, on the last part of the question, look, as I said when I opened, we think that Trump has to be defeated, you know, and we have to work now to uh, make sure that that happened. And we have to bring the issues to the fore to ensure that. So um, we don't endorse candidates from other parties. We'll see what the uh, convention produces. We hope that it produces a, uh, a, a, a candidate that, 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 that a, a movement can be built around and we will bust our ass in order to defeat Trump because we think that defeating him and the GOP is the most important imperative before the country. And if this crisis has proved nothing, in my opinion, it's proven that. That's all. Thank you, Joe. Um, Scott, next question. All right. Um, we have a question uh, regarding imperialism. Um, I'm trying to find it in there. a lot of questions here. So thank you everyone for, for sending these in. Um, uh, escalated aggression against Venezuela, continued continuation of illegal sanctions against Venezuela, Cuba, Gaza, Iran, and other countries renewed aggression of US proxies, uh, Israel against Gaza and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia against Yemen and other wars um, uh, is happening when everyone's attention is understandably focused on the virus. Um, how, uh, how is the Trump, let's see, how is the, the virus being used as cover for imperialist action and what can we do uh, about that? Uh, thank you. Um, Joe, you want to take a stab at that? Uh, I got the last part of the question, Scott, um, uh, with respect to how the uh, virus is being used as, a, as, a, as an excuse for imperialist manipulation. Um, and, and in that regard, this is a hugely important question because we can see what's going on in Venezuela. You know, they brought that aircraft carrier down uh, and they're trying to utilize uh, the uh, a crisis uh, and in particular the, the, the issue of providing uh, adequate medicines as an excuse for uh, in intervening. 
Um, and in that regard, I think that we have to bring uh, with other organizations and join in uh, hand in hand to bring as much pressure to bear to uh, prevent that, you know? Uh, and so you can do that by uh, making phone calls. You can do that by uh, texting. You can do that, uh, you can do that uh, by uh, uh, organizing as we can on the streets in a safe way, you know? I know that uh, some of our comrades in Texas and Houston were organizing car caravans with signs. So why not go down to the uh, uh, elected representatives' uh, residence or go down to city hall or to the state uh, legislature and make your voices heard, you know? I think that, 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 that the issue is that the people, you know, have to speak out uh, and speak out as loudly as possible in, in, in the, uh, the forms that are available to us right now to, to make sure that that happens. I don't know, I, I think I missed the first part of the question, Scott. Um, I, I think you covered it. The, the first part of the question was um, um, kind of a context and, and examples of where um, the focus of imperialism uh, now is. I think your response uh, um, uh, covered it pretty well. Okay, can we have the next question, Scott? Yeah, um, so, but first I wanted to uh, share um, a comment that someone wrote in. Um, I don't have any questions at this time. However, I do wanna thank each and every one of the speakers in this meeting. You've been very informative and really made, uh, made me appreciate even more to be involved with this party. Thank you, comrades. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Carl writes in uh, from Wisconsin. I'm a lawyer in Wisconsin, but with no experience in housing rights law. Any tips on where to look for options for tenant collective action? National scope would be great, but I understand that help there is limited. Uh, where to look at the local level? Uh, Ava, can you help us with that? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Carl writes, I'm a lawyer in Wisconsin, but with no experience in housing rights law. Any tips on where to look for options for tenant collective action? National scope would be great, but I understand that help there is limited. Where to look at the local level? Um, in Wisconsin, well, there's some national groups. There's um, Right to the City and Housing and Homes for All. I could put the links to those organizations. Um, they're a network that we're connected with and they would have a better idea of like who's on the ground in Wisconsin that you could connect with. So I can put the links to how to contact those organizations in the chat. Great, thank you. Scott, do we have another question? Um, yeah, we've got a, a, a kind of big cluster of questions that's sort of linked to the earlier one about, about the Democratic Party. Um, a cluster of questions around um, why aren't we doing or calling for more uh, uh, openly revolutionary measures? So why are we advocating for the continuation of uh, private insurance plans rather than, you know, full socialized medicine? Um, you know, a rent strike is great, but why not uh, strike everything, you know, rent, mortgages, student loans, uh, all debt? Um, uh, are we thinking of are we looking for opportunities for dual power in the context of this crisis? Um, okay, Joe, you wanna? Thanks, Rosanna. Well, comrades, you know, if, if I could make the revolution yesterday, I would, you know? But obviously I can't make it by myself here in, in New York, particularly in uh, conditions of uh, a, a you know, sheltering in place, uh, which I call stewing in place. I think that, um, you know, we have to master the ability of placing uh, immediate demands um, that will uh, move the largest number of people in the most effective way um, um, at the optimum time. We have to balance that against uh, and with and with placing long-term demands because it is uh, uh, through the uh, 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 
the struggle around, around both, around pressing the immediate issues, the ones that are, are winnable. Because you know, sometimes the most revolutionary demands are, are not the most radical ones. For example, you know, when, when Angela Davis was uh, arrested on murder charges, a huge movement developed in this country around, and around the world. And, and the, the, the slogan of that movement and of the, was free Angela and free Angela now. Um, but Henry Winston, who was the chairman of our party at that time, told the comrades who, who were uh, working in the Free Angela campaign, he said, no, that's not the most important issue at this time. And they stood and they looked and they said, well, well, well what is it? And, and, and Winston, we called him lovingly Winnie, he said, bail. Bail is, is the, uh, the, the most immediate demand around which we can build the broadest movement uh, to free Angela. I think that, that, that the same thing applies to the class and democratic struggle. We have to find those key issues um, uh, that, that, that can uh, 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 be won, you know, at the same time, you know, not uh, 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 downplaying the, the, the broader issues and then build, uh, build as we can. But that does not mean that we cannot also bring forward more radical demands. In my speech today, uh, in my talk, I talked about socializing the hospitals, right? In an article I wrote last week, I raised the issue of uh, a debt jubilee. Cancel, cancel all debt. Why not? You know, the, 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 uh, the uh, you know, Fidel Castro once said the third world debt is unpayable and uncollectible. Same thing is true with working class debt, even truer for student debt. Why not cancel it? So indeed, comrades, we, we are uh, uh, raising uh, uh, these uh, uh, issues. It is, you know, really difficult, impossible really to predict how a revolutionary transfer of power will develop in this country. Um, but I think that the point is that as we uh, go forward in uh, fighting this crisis, those uh, uh, more public, more radical demands uh, will certainly arise as the crisis deepens. You know, I raised the issue earlier of public works jobs like the WPA. The fact of the matter was that that uh, helped alleviate the crisis during the 30s, but it didn't solve it. The only way that they were able to solve it was uh, by starting this, by, by, by war production and joining in the effort to defeat fascism in Germany. We hope and pray something like that doesn't happen uh, today. And so, yeah, you know, we have to look seriously, we have to look hard, and yeah, we have to be ready to, to uh, place uh, the right demands at the right time. Great, thank you. Scott, we have another question? Oh, well, sorry. Could I weigh in on that last point real, real quick, if nobody sure. minds, I'm super sorry. Uh, you know, I just hearing this like, you know, oh, why are we working with coalitions and stuff? You know, when it comes to working with other groups, like I'm personally somewhat sympathetic to that point that we don't want to lose ourselves in our, you know, scientific analysis in a large coalition. But, you know, that being said, you know, there's a, a Gramsci quote I have pulled up that I think says it pretty well. And it's the old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. And I think that last point hits it very well. Now is the time of monsters. This is not the time for petty organizational disputes. You know, we need to get on the ground and help people. And it's not about 
uh, losing yourself in some grand coalition, you know, or selling yourself out. It's about creating networks and allies to help in immediate struggles. Just for an example, here in Orange County, we have uh, one of our local teacher unions, the head of their union is in our club, and they needed bodies to show up to oppose an ultra religious charter school that was going to be funded with taxpayer dollars. And because our group was able to mobilize the DSA to show up in numbers, our club specifically developed a relationship with union members. We created a reputation for showing up. So part of it is how you go about doing it. But, you know, even with working with other folks, a lot of DSA people and other groups have been really interested in our club because of what we've done. So, you know, joining a coalition is not inherently selling out, even though I'm somewhat sympathetic to that point. So it's, you know, the material conditions on the ground are really freaking important. So I just wanted to chime in. Sorry about that. Thank you, Sean. That's okay. Um, Scott, do you have any more questions? Yeah. Um, Maybe we can take uh, one or two more questions. Okay. Um, so uh, Camilla writes in, um, has CPUSA or any affiliated groups planned drive-in protests for ICE detention centers? I live in Alabama and have great concerns for those in the illegal Etola detention facility. Um, so that, any, any information on organizing against ICE would be terrific. There are many groups organizing against ICE. Um, it's best to join forces with them. Uh, but if you're able to to create, you know, a, a, a good group to do that, you know, I think that's best. I think you always want to look at what's what is um, what's is happening on the ground and how can we help support it or how can we maybe help initiate it. Uh, we don't have anything that is. Uh, organized, at least not to my knowledge, it could be, you know, comrades are moving very quickly on some of these things. So um, it, to my knowledge, we don't have any, any such effort right now. Scott, do you wanna have another question? Yeah, um, this is a group of a couple um, uh, kind of around unemployment. Um, so uh, Rory writes, does CPUSA find uh, Kropotkin's and anarchist ideas on mutual aid useful in this time? Also, can you suggest some good resources or books for us to learn about unemployed worker organizing? And uh, another attendee wrote in um, asking uh, if, you know, the, yes, uh, Joe writes in, um, if we were thinking about you know, bringing back the, the unemployed councils in this time of mass unemployment. Uh, Roberta, you want to answer that? Roberta? Trying to get yeah. back online here. Yeah, um, so the unemployed councils were um, a very, you know, in some ways similar to, to some of the um, uprisings I kind of referred to now that they were, they're grassroots based and people um, taking initiatives on their own. I think um, in this day and age, you know, we have to also look, and especially in this situation, develop um, the forms of struggle. It's really challenging to think about how to struggle when the normal way humans act is to get together and you know physically and so how do you um how do you have uh, actions and create solidarity and support in in that kind of a situation so um i think that we need to share some of those tactics it's a good thing that we do have the internet and people have done things you know like uh, petitions and things like that online um, i've seen where they have the people in their cars um, you know, doing activities. Um, but I think it's something that it's going to be uh, developed through the creativity of the working class. So there, I don't think there are easy answers. The answers are basically that we have to build the broadest movement. We can include as many people as possible, speak to everyone. I wanted to respond to the person in Alabama. Um, I, I'd love for to take that question up in our labor commission. If you um, write into us, maybe we can put that on our agenda and see how we could be uh, helpful in thinking through how to how to 
any <clears throat> anybody who wants to organize something, I will be happy to talk to them. <laughs> and let's figure out how we, you know, how do you reach other people in your area and uh, how do you build this, what, what we need to do this. It's wide open right now. I think the whole country is changing. People are changing about how they think about things. Okay, great. Um, I think we'll, we'll end there. Uh, we do want to put up our demands. We have several demands. Um, if uh, Laura can do that for us. And also, you know, we want to say no intervention to Vietnam, uh, an emergency extension of free healthcare, including coronavirus testing and treatment for all, in, and including the undocumented uh, immigrants, uh, lift the blockade on Cuba and sanctions uh, on Iran to stop hindering their ability to respond to the global crisis. Global cooperation, including with China, to defeat the global, um, to defeat the virus uh, is absolutely uh, essential. Release the refugees currently imprisoned at the border and in detention centers and elsewhere. Reversal of the new rules, turning away uh, amnesty seekers. And we'll keep these up for a little while. Uh, Cameron will uh, uh, um, close us off and uh, comrades can take a look at these demands. Uh, thank you again for all of, all of you for joining us. I want to uh, remind uh, anyone who wants to reach us, you can reach us at cpusa at cpusa.org. And if you want to get our text alerts, text the word MARKS to 555-888. Again, text the word MARKS to 555-888. Camera, Cameron, you want to close us off? Thank you, everybody.
Good night, everyone. Good night, comrades. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks a lot, the panelists. Y'all were wonderful. As were you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Take care now. Good night. Good night. Okay, good night, everyone. We are now closing the webinar. Good night and keep well. <laughs>